I will start my message tonight. Ashley, is the computer working? Yes, but it will shut off in 120 seconds. Okay, well, put, put, the, guy up. put the guy up. Does anybody know who that guy is? Anybody? That guy is Alexander Graham Bell. Did you know it? You knew it. Excellent. <laughs> now, Dora. <laughs> Alexander Graham Bell, a talented inventor and very accomplished individual. He was born in uh, 1847 and he died in 1922. He was credited with inventing multiple, the multiple telegraph, the audio meter that's used for uh, testing hearing, the tricycle landing gear used on airplanes still today, which I found interesting, many more machines. He was also the co-founder of Science Magazine, and he served as the president of the National Geographic Society for a time. I found those things interesting. Bell was also very involved in work with the deaf, as both his mother and wife were hearing impaired. The most famous of all of Bell's inventions was, of course, the telephone. Which we're going to see in a minute. <laughs> I know we will. Again, that to not Once Ashley gets us up, it's, a, it's just a cool thing. So we'll wait for that. But once it comes up, my question is, he made a telephone. Who do you call? Does anybody? I mean, who do you call? Watson there it is. Watson Carter, Watson. I need you. Yeah, I think that's it. I mean, anyway, I thought that was kind of funny. So this invention up here uh, made Bell and his family quite wealthy and quite famous yet. He almost missed the opportunity. This is kind of the Paul Harvey rest of the story. Alexander Graham Bell's father-in-law financed most of his projects. Bell, ever the inventor, had little time for details in the business side of things. His father-in-law was growing impatient with Bell in his seeming disinterest with protecting his newest invention. So on February 14, 1876, his father-in-law went to the patent office and filed the paperwork for his son-in-law's latest and perhaps greatest invention, the telephone. Now later that same day, Elisha Gray, another scientist and inventor, and inventor of the day, went to the patent office to file a patent for his latest invention, which was the telephone. He was too late, a couple of hours too late to file a patent on his invention. As for Bell, if it wasn't for his father-in-law's timely action, Alexander Graham Bell would not have been known as the inventor of one of the most important inventions of all time, the telephone. You see, it is not enough to have great faith in something or have a great idea. We must also act upon our ideas and our faith. Today, we're going to spend our time uh, diving a little deeper into the second chapter of the book of James. First, a little background about James. He was likely the brother of Christ. There were four men named James in the New Testament. One had died before the letter was believed to have been written. And the other two did not have the prominence in the community uh, to have written such a letter. James was probably the next oldest brother after Jesus. Matthew in chapter 13, 55 lists James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas as Jesus' brothers. The birthright was quite important to the Jewish people. And James, now being the oldest remaining brother, would have a place of prominence within his family and the community. Like most Jews of the era, James initially had a difficult time understanding Jesus' mission. In John 7, 22 through 5, James and his brothers encouraged Jesus to go to Judea and share his miracles with the world. Jesus, however, knew it was not yet his time, for his father had not instructed him to go. John 7, 5 says, For even his own brothers did not believe in him. Even though James had doubts, in time, the skeptic's views changed, and he ultimately became a prominent leader in the early church. This is evident from his references 
from the many references to him in various scriptures. Christ appeared to James after the resurrection, 1 Corinthians 15, 7. Paul calls him a pillar of the church in Galatians 2, 9. James is also mentioned as an important leader in the Council of Jerusalem, Acts 12, 17. And Paul visits with James, as is mentioned on several occasions throughout the New Testament. Scholars date the writing of this letter to have been somewhere between 45 and 65 AD, and the letter was written primarily for a Jewish audience. All this background information is to point out that this was one of the earliest letters written after Jesus' death and resurrection, and that the author was urging his readers to get it right, as this was the foundation of their faith. In these few verses, James is strongly encouraging the baby Christians of the day not to, to simply have faith, but to have a faith that would move a person to positive action, to have authentic faith. Let's take a closer look at James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26. These verses are subtitled, Faith and Deeds. Verse 14, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? James leads off this portion of his letter by warning his readers that pure head knowledge like that of the Sadducees and Pharisees was not enough to be a Christ follower. A Christ follower needed to use that knowledge, that faith in Christ, to share his love and mercies through their good deeds to those in need. You know, over the years, there have been, there's been great debate as to whether James's statement is in direct opposition to the Apostle Paul's writings. Paul wrote to the Galatians, Know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. And he writes to the Ephesians, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. So, does James oppose Paul's teachings here in verse 14? No, he, he's not doing that. James is merely saying that if you have a deep faith, an authentic faith in Christ, it will lead you to good works. Martin Luther put it this way. People are justified, that is, declared righteous before God, by their faith alone, but not by a faith that is alone. Genuine faith will provide good deeds. Not only faith, but only faith in Christ saves. Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes or daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. These are stern words from James. They are a call to action. How can we say that we have faith in Christ, yet we have never taken the time to personally show Christ's love to one of the least of these, as is described in Matthew 25? There are opportunities all around us every day to show Christ's love. A co-worker having a difficult day. The old man on the street corner with a sign that says, Feed me, I'm hungry. Or the grouchy neighbor who never smiles or has a nice word to say. What have you done to show your neighbor Christ? Giving assistance at a homeless shelter. You get the picture. James is pointing out that our head and our heart need to be working in unison. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith that is dead. Here is what I consider to be the key passage in today's lesson. It is not faith or deeds. It is faith and deeds. James wants to be crystal clear here. Good deeds should be a byproduct, the fruit of the Spirit, Good fruits, if you will, of our faith.
There are so many wonderful examples of faith in action right here at Agape. Last month, uh, the junior high and senior high Sunday school class went on a mission trip to South Bend where they served at a homeless shelter. Randy Miller works countless hours with a group of friends and volunteers organizing the annual Golden Living or Golden Opportunity Giveaway. Stacy Tharp and a group of volunteers host funeral and special occasion dinners here at the church. There are others that volunteer at the Salvation Army, the PAC Center, the hospital, and I'm certain I'm uh, missing other places uh, that folks are volunteering at. But hear this, church. This is the meat of the message. We are being called to grab our gear and get into the game. In addition to saying that we are Christians, James is calling us to get up off the couch and do something that shows that we are Christians. You believe that there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe that and shut up. It is simply not enough to believe. Even the demons believe. Our faith must travel from our heads to our hearts and be lived out so that others will know that we are Christians by our love. You foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called. James points out here that Abraham's faith in God was being lived out through his actions. Abraham's faith and deeds were both on the same page. He was following God, although he did not fully understand what God was doing. He still believed in the Bible. You know, so many times we are paralyzed by our fear and our lack of faith that we do not act upon God's calling. We all too often do not allow the Holy Spirit to work through us for God's glory. Have you ever felt a nudge from the Holy Spirit to do fill in blank, visit shut-ins, serve at a food pantry, deliver meals on wheels, become part of our praise teams, teach a Sunday school class, lead a small group, invite a neighbor, co-worker, or relative to church? Let Rod know that you want to do a communion meditation. Or let Rod or Matt know that you want to preach. The list is endless. Fear can paralyze us to inaction. But faith in Christ will win out every time if we let it. All the activities above, if entered into to glorify God, demonstrate your faith in action. Your good and pleasing, authentic faith. Verse 24 says just that. You see that a person is considered righteous by what he, by what they do, and not by faith alone. If our faith is authentic, there will be evidence of good fruit. We can have all the book knowledge of the great theologians of the day. We can be the president of a well-known Bible college. We can have a master's of divinity or a doctorate. We may be a well-known TV preacher or radio host. We can be that 20-year Sunday worship, morning worshiper but without showing Christ's love to others, what good is that for? In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction? As you may recall from the book of Joshua, chapter 2, Joshua sent two spies into the promised land, specifically Jericho, to check things out. The king of Jericho found out that the spies were staying at the house of Rahab and instructed her to turn them over to his men. She instead chose to protect the spies. Joshua 2.9 says, And Rahab said to them, I know that the Lord has given you this land and that a great fear of you has fallen on us, so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. Skipping to verse 11. When we heard all of it, our hearts melted in fear, and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on earth below. Now James is not endorsing 
uh, her occupation here. Understand that first of all. He is simply pointing out that a sinner such as Rahab, and for that matter, sinners like you and I, can also have authentic faith. Rahab abandoned what she had known in Canaan and its gods to follow the Lord in Israel. By harboring and helping Joshua's spies, she lived out her newfound faith with bold action. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. From a commentary out of the Theology of Work Project, the author sums up the verse like this. James does not command Christians to work for the benefit of others in need instead of placing faith in Christ, or even in addition to placing faith in Christ. He expects that Christians will work for the benefit of others in need as a result of placing their faith in Christ. And Matthew Henry put it this way, Faith is the root, good works is the fruit, and we must see to it that we have both. So where are you today? Where do we go from here? Are you living your faith out authentically? I mean, really authentically? Well, I too fall short. So what, what can we do? First, we can pray. We get our model for prayer from Jesus. Jesus, God's own son, frequently went alone to pray. There are numerous times that scriptures say Jesus went somewhere to pray. He was seeking God's direction. Seems to me that we should take a cue from Jesus and seek God's direction for our lives through prayer. Is your prayer life kind of blah or maybe it's not existent today? Wondering, well, where do I start? Try praying the way Jesus taught us to pray in Matthew 6, 9 through 13, also known as the Lord's Prayer. This is the NIV version. I'm going to read it for you. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. So pray. Listen. Listen. Listening skills are among the hardest skills to learn. Our minds are going 100 miles an hour, and we are often thinking of our response to the person that we are talking with, rather than actively listening and trying to absorb what it is they're telling us. In the same way with God. Through prayer, we can be more in tune with God, however, to receive his direction and his answers to our prayer. It is time for us to be still before him and actively listen. So listen. Fast. Fasting is not a talk topic that we often hear mentioned in modern Christianity. We have so much abundance that to consider depriving ourselves of something we enjoy seems a little unnatural to us. So what exactly is fasting? I have a decent idea. But where do we go these days to find out answers to questions such as these? I found allaboutgod.com. I thought this was good. These folks said, simply put, the purpose of fasting is to take our eyes off of the things of this world, including but not limited to food, drink, sleep, sex, TV, Facebook, cell phones, chocolate, this goes on. And instead of focusing on these worldly things, we are to focus on God. Fasting is not a Christian requirement. However, it is a way to become more in tune with God. Luke, in his gospel, describes fasting and praying as being linked together. And in the book of Acts, we learn that the believers, before making big decisions, they fasted. Fasting is not a punishment of the flesh, but a means by which to sharpen our focus on and connection with God. So fast. Observe. God is calling each of us to take off the blinders that we so often wear. He is calling us to see the needs around us, the opportunities that are all around us to show his love to the world. 
As James points out, it is not enough to have faith. We are to also have a faith that moves us to action. Look to find areas where you can make a difference by implementing prayer, listening, and fasting. Your radar is going to be keen to what God may be showing you to do. So observe. Act. Finally, we learn from James as well as others that faith without action is death. Folks, I want to encourage you today to earnestly pray, listen, fast, observe, and ultimately act. It is time to get up off the couch. It's time for us to get off the sidelines and show God's love for others through our actions. It's time for us to make a difference. It's time for us to do something. You remember my Alexander Graham Bell story that I shared earlier. If not for action, all of Bell's faith in his invention, the telephone, would have been for naught. In our Christian walk, we are encouraged to have a deep faith in Christ, and that faith should move us to action. It should lead us to good deeds. It's not enough to have faith alone. In other words, the natural byproduct of our deep connection to the true mind, Jesus, is the fruit of the Spirit that ultimately leads us to action serving people, all people. I'm going to close with a thought from Billy Graham, uh, uh, James 2, 14 through 26. Graham says this, In the Christian life, faith and works go together like inhaling and exhaling. It is in these terms. Faith is like taking the gospel in, and works is like taking the gospel out. Let's take the gospel outside of this building as we leave tonight. Let's let others see our authentic faith. I want to thank you for the opportunity tonight to, to share this message. And uh, as we lead into our time of uh, communion, just be mindful of the sacrifice, the amazing gift, the unfailing love we sang about it earlier that God showed to us through Christ. Christ went to the cross and his body was broken and his blood was spilled. And that's what these elements represent. So as you step to the communion uh, tables this evening, be ever mindful of that sacrifice and what the amazing gift Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your amazing grace and your unfailing love. Thank you that uh, you have shown us to have faith, but that that faith also needs to be translated into good, good works, into the fruit of your spirit. Dear Lord, as we step to the communion table, let us understand the amazing gift that you have given to us, the gift of your Son that leads us to eternal life. We love you.